Okay, it's been a long day. It's uh, it's the last one of the day. Uh, let's let's get it done. Uh, so I'm, I'm really happy to be here because uh, I went to last year's uh, Linux Plumbers in Richmond with a clearly defined goal of figuring out how to support uh, the Bluetooth and WLAN chips on Qualcomm platforms. I had lots of discussions, uh, many good ideas, and uh, after a year I'm actually here to report back on, uh, on a goal that's been achieved and we now uh, indeed have the power sequencing subsystem in the kernel. My name is Bartosz Golaszewski. I've been working on Embedded Linux for 15 years over. I am uh, pretty active in open source. I, I contribute to various projects and most of all uh, Linux kernel. And uh, I am currently with Linaro in the Qualcomm landing team. We make Linux run great on Qualcomm devices and be sure to check us out. So the problem that uh, we defined last year uh, is twofold. So there is uh, the first one is something that I refer to as the dynamic chicken, dynamic bus chicken and egg problem. So we have a, a family of devices where a device needs to be discovered on a bus so that it can be powered up, but it has to be first powered up so that it can be discovered. And uh, because how, how does it work in, in Linux? So typically when a device needs a set of resources to be enabled so that it can be, become functional, it's the driver of that device that's responsible for requesting those resources and enabling them. But this driver will not be bound to that device unless this device is detected on the bus. So we need to power it up so we can detect it. We need to detect it so we can power it up. Uh, where does it happen? So, for instance, if you have a PCI device that's uh, on a M2 card, but it's using custom pins, for instance, to, uh, to for, for GPIOs uh, that enable the, a, a module on that device, and this is not done automatically whenever the card is powered up, but this is driven by the host system, this is where it happens. And the second problem, uh, which is somewhat related, is sharing resources between devices. And uh, that's pretty, that's a normal thing. So certain resources like regulators, resets, clocks will be typically shared between devices. And uh, the frameworks, the subsystems for, for those uh, resources will typically implement reference counting. That's not, that's not a problem. But what happens when this is not enough? And for instance, you may have devices that uh, have additional interactions between themselves that you need to consider. For instance, there may be a delay uh, needed to, to be respected when between enabling two modules of, of a device. And this is the, the, the use case in, uh, for, for, those, for, for the WCN family of chips from Qualcomm where you need to respect a certain delay between enabling the Bluetooth and WLAN modules so that they boot up correctly. Also, you may have uh, a complex set of dependencies between, uh, between enabling the resources of the device, of, of, of the modules on, on, on the device or, or two devices, and uh, some additional timings in the power-up power sequence. And eventually, it turns out that it's useful to abstract that in a, in a single place so that you get some code reuse, you don't repeat yourself, and, and uh, that's allow, having less space for introducing bugs. This is not, uh, both problems are not new, and they have been uh, approached from different uh, sides uh, multiple times already. Uh, we do have a thing that is called uh, MMC power sequencing in the kernel. Although the DT maintainers have said that, uh, especially Rob Herring has said that um, he regrets merging the bindings for it, but we are stuck with it because it's, uh, it's ABI now. Um, I tried to reuse those for our use case, but uh, this was, this was uh, shut down. Then Dmitry is not here, but uh, he submitted a um, a proposal for a power sequencing subsystem uh, two years ago. It was uh, pretty functional. It supported Bluetooth and WLAN on Qualcomm platforms, but it also uh, used DT device tree in a way that's uh, forbidden, and I'm going to talk about it in a second. Oops, sorry. 
And uh, finally, during last, last year's uh, Linux Plumbers, we discussed uh, a thing that we referred to as M2 PCI slot driver. Eventually nothing came out of it, uh, but this was the base for, for what I did with, with uh, PCI and uh, what I'm gonna, I'm gonna be showing soon. Um, basically, the idea was to introduce a speci special driver for PCI slots, but uh, as Krzysztof said, uh, this is not something, so the slot is not a real device, and also if it's used in a standard way, then it won't require any driver because you will plug in your card, it will be powered up and the device uh, will be booted, will be, will be powered up. But if you start using custom pins on that M2 connector, then what you really have is a hardwired device that you need to describe in device tree correctly as it is without going through a, an, an additional abstraction layer for the slot driver, for the slot device. So what is, uh, what is the main concern for device tree is that you don't describe behavior of hardware in device tree, but what it is, how it, the topology of, of hardware, if you will. And of course, there's the whole gray area of limits, like the regulator uh, voltages or, or safe states of, of, of various components. But this is still, uh, this still des describes the hardware, but you cannot really introduce timings for for a power-up sequence of a device into the device tree. That's, that's not what it's uh, used for. So this is an example. Uh, what, what can we describe in device tree? Well, we can describe uh, you know, what GPIOs it takes, what regulators, but you cannot really have a p-handle for a power sequencer that describes uh, a, a, a sequence of events during the, power up, the, the booting of a device and assign it to, to a device. That's a no-go and uh, that's pretty well established. The good thing about device tree is that there is no reason for device tree to map to C code in drivers one-to-one, -one. meaning that uh, there is a common misconception that if you have a regulator or a PMEC node in device tree, uh, or a GPIO controller node in device tree, then this has to map to a GPIO or regulator driver in C code. That's not really, uh, that there is no such rule and it's not required, not enforced. Meaning that you can very, mu very well have a node in device tree that looks like a PMEC, but the underlying C driver does something completely different with it. And, uh, and that's fine. So, uh, Knowing this, um, I came up with an idea for, a, for the first part of the solution to the problem, which is the power, se sequencing, problem, uh, power sequencing, uh, subsystem, which uh, I'm going to call it power seek, power sec. So, what is the what is the main um, design idea behind it? make it as simple as possible for consumers. So provide a very limited set of APIs, just get the power sequencer handle, put it, and then power it on, power it off. Make it maybe not very simple for providers, but make it very flexible. Meaning that uh, let's allow providers to split the power up sequence into discrete chunks, specify dependencies between them, and uh, match consumers to providers at runtime, dynamically, and allow, don't enforce any specific interpretation of device nodes. Instead, allow pr provider drivers to do what they need and interpret device nodes on their own. So this is an example of uh, consumer code, as it is right now. And what we have here is a very simple uh, standardized getter where you get the handle to the power sequencer. Um, so the, the, the foo string is just the name for the target of the power sequence. So every device, every consumer device will want to reach a certain target. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, talk about, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you the overview of the glossary for the subsystem uh, in the following slides. The consumer may specify its target unit that it wants to reach. In this case, it's going to be called Foo, but it uh, typically would be called something like Bluetooth or WLAN. Then the next thing is just power on the my part of the device, so bring up uh, the device to the level of functionality that I, that I require as a consumer. 
And uh, yeah, we, we also have managed variants of the, of the APIs and uh, the descriptor that we get is an, another abstraction layer that makes the power sequencer, the, the provider, uh, secure from malicious users or, or users who simply uh, have buggy code. So I, I, uh, I added some system Ds to, to, the, to the subsystem. So the, the first uh, thing that we're dealing with is the unit. So this is a chunk of a power up sequence. Uh, it has binary state, so a unit can be enabled or disabled. Uh, the enable state for unit is uh, counted, meaning that uh, users will, uh, the first user will increase it to one and then the unit will be on. Subsequent users will increase the reference count and uh, the unit will not get disabled before all units uh, release the reference, their reference. And uh, each unit may have a set of dependencies defined, meaning other units, other pieces of the power-up sequence uh, on which this unit depends. And uh, these dependencies have to be enabled before this unit is considered enabled. And of course, uh, the other way around, this unit has to be disabled before any of, the, of its dependencies can be disabled. And examples, yeah. So a unit can consist of enabling a clock or a set of clocks, enabling a GPIO or the asserting a reset. And then the, the unit, the final unit that a consumer wants to reach, um, we refer to it as, as a target, and it's a named unit. So in this case, it will be, for instance, called uh, Bluetooth for the Bluetooth module of a uh, complex device. And it may depend on, let's say, regulator or a set of regulators. So you will have the Bluetooth and the WLAN units depend on the same unit and the code will be reused. Um, and finally, we have the descriptor. And descriptor is basically an opaque structure that the consumer gets. Descriptor makes sure that a single user will not be able to enable its unit twice. So you, the, the consumer gets a descript, the, the descriptor, and the descriptor holds the state. Either it's enabled or disabled. And so it's, a, it's, a, it's an intermediary between the power sequencer and the consumer that's, uh, that, that pays attention to the, that ensures pro proper reference counting. So this is real output from debugfs for a power sequencer. And you can see that you have the Bluetooth and the WLAN devices that have enabled their, their, their targets. And then the target unit depends on the regulators enable, the clock enable, and then the clock enable units. It's this, it's, it's these, these, two depend, these two units are the, the dependencies of both Bluetooth and WLAN units. And uh, yeah, so in order to enable the Bluetooth, the reference count for regulators and clock was increased by one. The same happened for WLAN, so this is why it's two, and uh, the Bluetooth and WLAN units have the refer reference count of one, and the dependencies are, are listed. So how do we uh, typically match consumers to providers uh, in, in Linux drivers? So that would typically happen at uh, build time, or rather when, when, you, when you have a device tree, when you have the device tree properties and you have, uh, let's say, a GPIO provider and a handle to that GPIO in a, in a, in a consumer, uh, you will typically know at build time that this P handle needs to be uh, a valid one. And for power sequencing, we still can use P handles, but they will be parsed at runtime, not when the provider is probed, but rather when the consumer requests a handle. We cannot do it really any other way if, if we don't have a set of def defined properties in, uh, in firmware that, uh, that the provider parses, and this is the case here. So uh, what we do is every provider has to implement a match callback. And then the functionality of that callback is entirely driver specific. So basically we take a device tree node and the provider is free to do whatever it wants with it. So unlike, let's say, regulators, we don't really expect a specific regulator P handle, we, but we may use it. The consumer now calls pa, power, uh, power set get. The power sequencing core will go through the list of all providers and call the match callback for everyone, for, uh, each, and for each of them. 
and we will then see, okay, so this in, in our example for, for the Qualcomm WCN chips, we will see, okay, we have an, a, an output modeled in device three from the power management unit of that uh, chip into the Bluetooth uh, module. So let's see if the P-handle parses to the correct consumer. Okay, that's the PMU mo node going into the, cons the, the, the Bluetooth node we know that this is the provider for this consumer. So we can return, create and return the, the handle uh, to, the drive, to the consumer driver. Okay, so that's the power sequencing. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna sh sh give, give you a better example uh, later when, when, when you connect the two, but uh, is, is anything non unclear? Because I, I know this is pretty complex. If you have any questions uh, now regarding the power sequencing subsystem, maybe that would be a good moment for, for it. Okay, otherwise I'm, I'm gonna continue. So that's the first part of the solution, but we still, cannot power up our PCI device, uh, or rather cannot detect it because it's still not powered up. For that, uh, having discussed the idea for the slot driver that would handle the resources for dynamic PCI devices that need to be uh, powered up by the host system, uh, we came up with an idea for the well, the, 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 the name I chose is PCI power control, but that's just for, for want of a better name because the power sequencing was already taken by the subsystem. Okay, so when you have a hardwired PCI device, you typically will model it in device three as a sub-node, a child node of the, of the PCI um, endpoint. So in this case, this is a real life example of a PCI uh, ATH11K chip for on, on, one of the, on one of the Qualcomm um, WLAN and Bluetooth chips that's described in device three because it's uh, hardwired. What PCI core will do when it will detect, discover that device on the bus, it will bind that PCI device to that device node. So an idea uh, on how to power up that device so that it can actually be discovered is let's because device, uh, a device tree node can be consumed by multiple devices, there's nothing wrong with that. Let's create, when we see that device in device, let's create a platform device binding to that node, the goal of which will be to power it up, request regulators, uh, drive GPIOs, make, it, make the device boot, and then tell the PCI core, okay, now you're good, you can rescan the bus, you can detect the device. So this is what we do. When the PCI controller probes, it will create a device for its endpoint and then populate the device nodes that are children or the device node that is a child of that, of that endpoint, create a platform device. This should match to the platform device that we implemented in the, in the PCI power control uh, family of drivers. It will probe, it will enable its resources, so request regulators drive uh, GPIOs. And now, okay, core can rescan the bus. This will make the device, uh, well, it, this, will, this will make the PCI core dis discover that device. And now what happens? We, we get notified, okay, that device is discovered. We can now, uh, I'm sorry, we can now create a, um, a, Connect that device, or, okay, I'm, 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 gonna, I'm gonna talk it in, on, on, about it on the next slide because I, I, need, I need to illustrate it somewhere, somewhat. The API for that is very simple. There are just two, fu two functions and a simple configuration structure that you fill with in, inside the rele relevant platform power control driver. And uh, then when the host bridge is probed, the device gets populated and we mark, uh, when, when we discover that uh, device, the PCI device, we bind it to the off node and mark it as reused because there are two devices that are bound to it. So how, it, how is it all connected? So you have the PCI host bridge device and it creates its PCI endpoint device. Now, we instantiate the PCI power control platform device as the child of that host bridge, enable the device, or power it up, then it appears. We discover it. The PCI core makes it a child of the PCI endpoint. And now 
we get notified about that device appearing in the system and we can create a dev link making the PCI device become the child of the platform device that drives it for proper power management, uh, to, to enable proper power management so that we don't disable the PCI device uh, before we disable its resources, I'm um, oh, sorry, so that we don't disable the resources of that PCI device before we uh, actually want to disable it. And when we take both those things together, we end up with a, a very nice, very small power sequencing PCI power control driver. And this is what makes, uh, this is what we're using to uh, enable support upstream for Qualcomm Bluetooth and WLAN chips. Uh, this all has been merged into mainline. It's been released as part of uh, Linux 6.11. I'm still in the process of uh, fixing some bugs, but in general, this has uh, enabled WLAN and, and Bluetooth support on several Qualcomm platforms. I'm saying that the X13S laptop is using it. It, it is, but uh, there are still uh, device tree changes that need to be uh, accepted upstream. That should happen. I, it's not going to happen for 6.12, but uh, I, I'm, I'm targeting 6.13 now. And it turns out that this subsystem is actually quite well, it seems useful and needed because as soon as that was picked up, I uh, got a submission from AM Logic that uh, does basically the same thing. Uh, it did not quite, uh, so that the author did, did not uh, quite understand the, the idea behind the, this flexible interpretation of device tree nodes. But, uh, well, that, that, that's just an implementation detail. It still, me it still means that uh, other, other vendors have the same issue with their chips. <laughs> And uh, the process for the power sequencing subsystem could be improved. So right now, because the device tree nodes for the power management unit of the uh, Qualcomm, chi Qualcomm Bluetooth and WLAN chips looks like a PMIC, it goes through the regulator tree. But that, maybe that doesn't really make much sense because uh, it's, uh, well, it looks like a PMIC, but it's actually supported by the power sequencing driver. So yeah, it's, it's a, uh, it's a question of who should uh, pick up those patches eventually. And uh, yeah, so this concludes the, the power sequencing story. After a year of development and uh, discussions, it's uh, finally upstream. And uh, yeah, let me know if, if uh, this makes sense. And if you have any questions, if you think that it's useful and maybe Maybe it could also be used in different. Well, I mean, I know that there is there is at least one uh, other device from Qualcomm being developed. Uh, the, the the driver for it being developed that will re reuse the subsystem. So that's and that's. Uh, Maybe for complete, uh, completeness, can you show us the device three sources? How do they look like for this uh, power sequencing thingy? Can I? I uh, this, this this is not my laptop. So this is uploaded. So the, the uh, slides were uploaded. Yeah, yeah not easily. Um, okay, then, then okay. no, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he can probably show you afterwards offline. Oh, Krzysztof already knows them, <laughs> I think he... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's a question over there. Oh, questions, yeah. Um, hello. Um, could you compare to handling the power sequencing in the parent device? Because I believe every example you gave, you always have a three hierarchy of devices where you had a parent that could, in theory, handle every resource that needs to be enabled, or not? I'm not sure I'm... Uh, um, if you take a uh, talk about bus, uh, so you always have your bus controller at top, um, it could do the power sequencing, and then the child would not have to care about it. Would that not work? Or did I misunderstand something? Well, the power, you are driving the power for the, for the, for a specific device, so you need to do... Yeah, well, then you create a specific API between the child and the parents. You already have many, I guess, on PC. But PCI. you don't know what the child is unless you... 
Well, you, 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 you know from device tree, but someone needs to handle it. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm okay, not okay. I might have misunderstood something. Um, uh, second question. Um, it rings a bell uh, and looks really similar to what uh, Stephen Boyd presented earlier about generic power domains. Could you compare it to this solution? I mean, you attach both devices to a single uh, power domain and have that enabled the devices? I am not, uh, I, I have not seen that presentation. Uh, it wasn't here, it was at e uh, e Oh, it was at uh, ELC, I guess. Does, yeah. it, d does it do the same thing? Uh, so that, that will probably know, know more about it. Uh, I mean, I think there definitely is overlap, so we should make sure that Stephen, I think Stephen is aware of, of uh, the power sequence stuff anyway, uh, and so maybe there's overlap where he can use some of it. He was looking more at sort of a board level driver that would power up devices in there and trying to combine clocks and regulators and things like that. So it's sort of a lot of the same kind of things, but he was trying to remove all of the hard coded power sequencing from every driver, even if it already would have worked fine, right? So even for a built-in device, it's not probable, right? Like you have your I2C touchscreen driver and you can, it works just fine today, but he was trying to lift those types of things out so that we didn't need to deal with all of the power sequencing and all of the drivers. So there's a lot of overlap between them, so but it's not exactly does the same. does it mean that he basically reuses the code if there is a similar set of operations to power up a device, then he puts it into a domain, and then this domain is reused by several yeah. de devices, is that it? I mean, I think the idea of his stuff, which is to sort of copy some of the ideas of ACPI, but not put the implementation of the ACPI enable and disable all in the firmware, but put it in the kernel. And so that was sort of the overall gist of what he was pushing for, right? And so in that sense, I don't know. I don't know how to answer your question in that sense. Is, but is, is, that, is that upstream or is that? No, no, it's only a proposal. A proposal. He, he, it, was, it was a proposal he talked about at, at ELC. So maybe, maybe we could. Uh work together and... Uh, yeah, you should find him. Definitely. He's at the conference. He I, just I, I isn't here, him. so... It's a question. So. Go ahead. Uh, okay, if I understood it correctly, uh, for the Qualcomm, you had some sophisticated device tree and some sophisticated uh, setup. My question is if it would be possible to reuse any of those uh, description to handle simple device like single power sequencing of the Wi-Fi or uh, SDIO card. Is it possible to use any of those examples from Qualcomm that they are uh, they are simple enough to be reused in simple embedded use cases? Mm, no, so the thing I'm doing, maybe, maybe this, this is why, why I should probably uh, have shown the, the device three sources. So the device that we're dealing with is a chipset that has several modules in it. Uh, it has the WLAN module, it has the Bluetooth module. <clears throat> the Bluetooth module talks to the host over serial, the WLAN talks to the host over PCI, and then inside that chipset you also have a power management unit that powers the two and takes inputs from the host. Uh, okay. So now uh, we were considering modeling the slot and, and, and making the driver for the slot power up the device. But this is, you know, this is not really what it is. What you have instead is you have the WLAN module and the Bluetooth modules, which are, module, module which are, are already modeled in device tree. Let's also add another node for the PMU. Let's model the inputs it takes from the host. Let's model the outputs it provides. Let's direct them, like, let's, let's, let's connect the three in device three, take the outputs from that power management unit, drive, uh, drive them to the WLAN and Bluetooth modules, and make it look, like, ma make it what it is, make it three discrete devices that are inside a package. This is the correct representation of reality, and then implement the drivers that will take that description and uh, use it to well, to power up the device when it's, uh, when it's detected. Okay, if I ask, uh, do you plan that the power seek uh, will replace the, uh, the first approach which you mentioned, that was the... 
MMC Power. MMC Power. Oh, I was secret. told to not touch it and uh, just just okay. <laughs> just ignore that it's there. I mean, there's there's also another related one which I think came up at Plumbers last year, which is USB as well, right? So, so yeah, the, so the, the 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 PCI power control. I, this this is not uh, entirely my my idea. It was based on the onboard USB, onboard hub, USB yeah. which does pretty much the same thing. It's a platform device that it's broke at boot time, and then it uh, it powers up the the USB device. That's well, right. quasi in, hard, hard in, wave. in your cases, you you can be a little nicer where you're you, you're not requiring an an extra top level node. I know the USB hub. Essentially, like if you've got a USB 3.0 hub, it is represented in device tree as three nodes, right? Yes. One top level one, one under the USB 2.0 hub, and one under the USB, or one under the USB 2.0 controller, one under the USB 3.0 controller. So we don't change the DT representation in this case. The Wi-Fi node used to be there. It's still there. We right. just detect it. Right. Create a platform just, device for it, and you're essentially creating a platform device under the PCIe host, which yes, is the, the and so you're you're sort of almost probing that device, that same compatible twice, once as a platform device and once as a PCIe device. Well, the compatible is only used to match platform devices, so it's not it's not. Uh, oh, I guess that's true. Okay, that makes sense. It yeah, it, it it still creates another device under yes. that node, but it's not. And there are two struct devices consuming the same off node, right. which is perfectly fine. This is supported in in, in the kernel, so that's. Uh, okay. Yeah, that's cool. So I think the simple case, I mean, uh, for this power sequencing, the MMC and the USB is already handled, so the framework here does not solve them because they're already kind of solved. And I think there are no other buses which would be discoverable and would need the power sequencing. I think PCI, USB, and uh, SDIO is done. Uh, MDIO, that's ah, another... Uh, but it also has, I think, its own stuff. No? Well, right now there is the chicken and egg problem in MDIO as well. Uh, that's not solved with, with this because I, I, I did not really look into it. But uh, right now you have a lot of files that will be hard coded in device tree so that they can be powered up because otherwise they would not be detected because they are not powered up and they cannot be powered up because they're not detected. No? Ironically, if you wanted another example, not to open up a total can of worms, but you could theoretically make AD EDP panels, you could say, is the same problem as this. So EDP panels are, to some extent, a DP panel, right? Or it's a, it's a DP device, but you know, there, it's because when it's EDP, it's always there, and so you just, the, the EDP driver just says, hey, if I'm EDP, I'm always present, and therefore you don't have to like detect it or anything like that. And so it, it's, kind of another instance of it, but for a given EDP panel, it's always going to be EDP. It's not like something where, you know, you see a PCIe slot and you're just modeling it as a PCIe slot. Um, anyway, it's, it's another almost pseudo example of something similar. Did you have a, another question? Uh, no, I think it's, it's... Oh, sorry. It's okay. No, it's okay. Other questions or comments? I have one question. This is Shwa. I'm uh, attending remotely. Uh, one question I have is, um, uh, do you have to have a power sequence? Um, we talked, we covered the enable part. Is there a disable component that's necessary for this, uh, either when you remove mod, um, or unload the modules? Yes, so each unit and can define its enable and disable callback. So they, they basically you know, go in one direction and then they go back, they, they, they disable the resources. So definitely that's, that's, that's handled, yes. So the, the, the two okay, main operations for a consumer is power up and power down, and then each unit will go through its power, through its enable and then disable callback. So in, in this case, we can enable the regulators, disable them, enable GPIOs, disable them. And they don't have to be symmetric. So for instance, the delay for the delay between enabling the GPIOs for Bluetooth and WLAN needs to be respected when enabling the chip, but not when disabling it. Thank you. All right, last call. Any questions or comments? Uh, if not, let's thank um, Bartos and... Uh, Great presentation, and that's the end of the Kernel Summit track for, uh, for 2024. Thank you all. Yay. Thank you.